Welcome to Stick at Night. I'm Hudson County Commissioner Anthony Romano representing District 5, the great cities of Hoboken and Jersey City. Today with us, we have a candidate for the United States Congress, Rob Menendez, Jr. Rob, welcome. Stick, good to be on with you. Rob, so tell us a little about you, born and raised around uh, where and all, tell us. Yeah, sure. So born and raised in Union City, New Jersey, uh, 15th and Bergen Line. I uh, live in Jersey City now over in the Lafayette neighborhood with my wife and uh, two-year-old daughter turned two this week. That's right, congratulations, you, baby so girl. Uh, yeah, she's great and uh, everyone's healthy, so I can't complain. I've been a lawyer for the last 10 and a half years. Uh, for the last it's year or so, lawyer. I've been uh, on the Board of Commissioners for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and also serve on the Board of Trustees at the Hudson School in, in your hometown of Hoboken, Yes, New you're quite a legend there. You're a graduate and they think very highly of you and never forget you, and I think that's, that's a wonderful thing that you donate uh, you know, your experiences and your time to help them uh, when it comes to education. So a uh, law firm, how, you enjoy being a lawyer? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, I went straight to the firm after I graduated. Um, it's been a great, great experience there working with really exceptional professionals. Um, the way the firm's structured, we also have a center for public interest. So I've been able to do some pro bono work in the community uh, with entrepreneurs in, um, in the district and um, worked on a voting rights case uh, before the Supreme Court. So, you know, a lot of interesting work. Um, it's given me sort of the ability to deal with complex issues um, and come to solutions as, as you know, counsel to a variety of clients. So it's been it's been a phenomenal experience. OK, the big question, what made you want to jump into the political arena? Yeah, so listen, so we, we announced on January 6th and we chose that date because a year before well, everyone in the country was watching television as we thought we were going to turn the page on the, the Trump presidency um, and close that, that dark chapter in our country's history. Instead, what we all watched was, was an insurrection, was an attack on our capital. Um, and instead of moving in a more positive direction, we continue to see us, our country move in, in a negative direction. Uh, it's on a bad trajectory. So when, when Congressman Sears, who, who I revere, who's been a, a friend and a role model and a mentor, decide to retire, I asked myself, can I be of service, uh, service to the place I've always called home? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, I believe that we have to do the work ourselves, that we can't wait for other people to do it. And in this, in this moment, in our country's history requires everyone, everyone being actively involved. So this is, this is me doing my part to, to move the country forward, to get us back on track and come up with real solutions that will impact the families who call the 8th Congressional District home. Well, ironically, what better mentors to have than you've grown up around uh, Congressman Sierras and Alvio is also a, a great friend and a, I consider a mentor. And uh, someone, you know, you, you, you carry the burden, sometimes a heavy burden of being the son of a very famous uh, man here in Hudson County, who I consider a political mentor from, from day one for me and uh, a good friend. Uh, how, does, how does your father feel about you entering uh, the political era, arena? Yeah, you know, he was always hesitant about my sister or I uh, pursuing a career in public service. You know, he's been doing this since he was 18 years old, as you know. Yeah. Um, school board in Union City. And it's tough, you know, and it's tough. The times that we're in now politically are tough. Um, the extreme polarization, uh, the refusal to compromise, the refusal to come to the middle and get anything done. And, you know, it's, it's a toxic environment and it's challenging for families. And so I think for him, he always, you know, would have pre preferred that my sister and I not do this. But that, that to me is also, I've, I've seen what public service means, both from him and my mother who, you know, was a public educator. Her, her wonderful, entire wonderful career. woman. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, you know, and if inside of you, you believe that people can be of service and that you can be of service, um, at some point you can't ignore that anymore. And that overrides all the reasons not to pursue something. So, you know, for me, you know, in this moment, as I mentioned, the way I look at it is whatever issues we don't resolve today, they're going to be our issues tomorrow and they become my daughter's issues when she becomes an adult. And, 
the issues that we see constantly are compounding and getting worse. So for me, it's, it's a question of we need to do work right now. We can't wait any longer. So, you know, that's why I chose to listen to that, that voice inside of me that says we all need to do something. And this is my opportunity to, to do more for our community. It's, it's ironic that you said that on a different level. Obviously, my father was a policeman and he did not want me to become a policeman at all. And, and the same thing, I just felt the calling. And then when you got into it, I felt the need to serve. And, and it, is, it is something it's, it's tough when your father is in that arena that you're in. Uh, you know, especially if successful uh, as your as your dad is, he's held almost every political office. Uh, he's been at it, as you said, since that's a long time. Since he's 18, and he still has the energy and drive. He was just recently in Taiwan. So tell us some about the platform. What uh, are your goals? What areas of interest do you have? What do you where areas do you want to attack and try to? I, I like what you said about solving problems. Yeah. Everybody throws blame around, but let's solve problems. For sure. And listen, I think the last two years of this pandemic have been extremely difficult for working families. So I think you have to go address those core issues, right? You have to look at the stresses that have impacted families in the district. So one of the things I think is most important is early childhood education, early childhood health care, you know, taking care of our youngest in our community and relieving that stress for parents. So, you know, Democrats have proposed universal pre-K. They've proposed capping child care expenses at 7% of a family's income. Um, those are real tangible um, differences in people's lives if we're able to achieve them. Um, you know, in addition, you have to look at affordability in housing and health care and education uh, because those stresses are felt throughout the community, throughout families. So you have to look at ways that you can build more affordable housing with access to public transportation. You have to look at how much, you know, our schools and higher education is costing and you know, also investing in our community colleges and workforce development, giving people a variety of pathways to achieve upward mobility. Um, and when you think about the 8th Congressional District, you know, Congressman Series has served on transportation and infrastructure for a number of years. We have to look at our infrastructure system. We have to look at our public transportation and how people move around. Um, you know, those are a variety of issues that impact people today that we need to address, build forward on. And then, of course, when you look at this district, we have to come up with a comprehensive plan for immigration, brings people out of the shadows, makes them makes them feel like they're full members of our society because they already do so much. So um, that is something that we can no longer ignore. Um, the crisis is only going to get worse if we refuse to act at the federal level. And that's something that will be a priority day one for us. Well, when we come back from commercial break, we'll discuss the rising gas prices, the frustration of um of many Americans in getting parts, whether it be chips for, for their vehicles, uh, whether it be uh, other parts, water meters that I've encountered people calling and asking about this shortage and how do we attack that? And hopefully, how do we get manufacturing back in this country and yet at the same time balance with, with unions? Because we're, we're supporters of unions, but the, the cry is always, that, well, we can't make it here because it's cheaper overseas. I'm your Hudson County Commissioner, Anthony Romano, with Rob Menendez, candidate for U.S. Congress. Uh, we'll be right back after this commercial break. So stay with us. There's still a lot to talk about. And uh, it's a pleasure having you on, Rob. Thanks, Dick. We have to be able to police ourselves because we don't want anybody to tarnish our badge. When internal affairs complaints are not handled properly, the public may believe that most officers commit crimes, when in fact that's not true. Most officers are professional. Most officers do not commit crimes. Um, if, the com if complaints aren't taken properly and the community that we serve doesn't have a trust in the police department, I mean, th th there has to be legitimacy. Um, if, if the community doesn't trust the police, how could we effectively serve them? by having a really comprehensive internal affairs unit that handles the complaints properly and people have trust in, in the system, it enables us to do our entire job as a police department much better. We need the community as much as they need us. So that citizen that has lost trust in the community could be a very important witness for us tomorrow. Hudson TMA reminds you that before you ride, you should perform the ABC Quick Check. Here's how to do it. You don't want your bike to fail you. So get in the habit of doing the ABC Quick Check before you ride. A is for air. Check that your tires are properly inflated. They should be pumped up to the inflation rating printed on the tire. 
Many bicycle pumps come with a pressure gauge, so you can make sure they're properly inflated. Low pressure tires can easily puncture. B is for brakes. Check that your brakes are working. Your brake lever shouldn't come closer than a thumb's width to the handlebar. Your wheel should spin freely when the brakes are off. C is for the cranks, chain, and cassette. Grab both crank arms like this and wiggle them to make sure they aren't loose. Spin the pedals and make sure the chain runs smoothly through the gears. Quick means making sure your wheels are on tight if you have quick release wheels. The wheels should be snug in the dropouts and the quick release lever fastened tight. Welcome back to Stick at Night. Let's continue with congressional candidate Rob Menendez. Rob, before the break, we're talking about gas prices. Which, uh, we said we'd talk about that. I want your thoughts and about the fact there's a shortage of so many uh, supplies. I know, for example, I have a, my lease has been up for months, but they don't have the parts for the, the cars to come. Uh, water meters, uh, they can't repair the water meter uh, in my house because there's a shortage of water meters. It goes as far as pool sticks are coming from China. What do we do? What ideas do you have? How do we combat this? Yeah, so listen, and it's an issue that impacts all families, right? Because it's the rising cost of goods, the accessibility of goods. So it's, it makes sense. This is what's on people's minds. Um, listen, Congress is acting, right? Um, President Biden took executive action to free up a lot of the ports and create uh, a greater influx of goods. Um, right now, be pending before Congress is the Competes Act which is gonna bring hopefully a lot of those high-end manufacturing jobs back to the United States. Um, and there was actually an uh, article this week about it coming back to New Jersey. Unfortunately, outside the district, it would be in New Brunswick, but bringing those high-tech manufacturing jobs back here, creating more manufacturing opportunities here in the United States is, is a fundamental importance because it not just impacts people's bottom line and their, their, their pocketbooks and their wallets, but it also impacts our national security. Because when you're unable to obtain a lot of this high-end technology that's be being produced offshore, specifically in China, um, who hasn't always been you know, a friendly um, participant to the United States, it becomes extremely important to be able to produce that technology here. So you safeguard your economy, you safeguard your national interest. So I think continuing to, to introduce legislation like the Competes Act, which brings those jobs back here, makes sure that critical components and parts that fuel our entire um, chain of, of uh, goods is being developed here. That will also lower cost of goods and we will have more control over it. So it's definitely an issue. We have to continue to approach it from every possible angle. Um, and you'll see a reduction in cost and you'll see our national security rise to a much better place than it is currently. I think that what the devil's advocate of that is they're going to a lot of the uh, owners always say, well, we have to go overseas because the unions. So how do we find this balance where the unions uh, are, are, you know, balanced with the uh, uh, employers. Yeah. So, so listen, we're, we're, we're all in on unions. We're all in on right. organized labor. Um, it's one of the most important uh, groups that we've done outreach with because they protect workers, right? And the last two years have been a challenge for workers, both in their, their workplaces, right? And the, making sure that they're safe and that workers are safeguard against the, the various strains and ills. Um, and also making sure that wages continue to grow because we're seeing this disparity between the highest income earners and the, and the yes. lowest income earners. And that just shouldn't be the way we operate. So, you know, listen, I think you can have a robust economy where, where companies are making a profit, but you're also protecting the worker. You look at CEO pay, executive pay, it's far outpacing what the median average of, of a salary is for a worker in any of these organizations. So there is capacity. And anyone that tells you otherwise, you know, I think is, is not being intellectually honest about it. So, you know, we should have those jobs back. They should be union jobs and we should be rising up our workers, uh, empowering our workers and making sure that they have upward mobility for them and their families. Absolutely. And, and you know, like, for example, if you want to take your uh, children to a, a ball game right now, baseball, football, it's expensive. But yet the athletes are making these phenomenal salaries. So, you know, where do you find the balance, as you said, uh, between wh where everybody can be affected equally? not where some are just uh, and others are suffering the burden. Yeah, listen, I, I think I think there's components of our economy that are out of sorts. Right. And there is it is there is this imbalance. And you feel that when you talk to families who are working multiple jobs, just trying to make ends meet. 
Um, you know, there's ways to recalibrate the economy, ways to better balance it. I think um, advocating for workers and the ability to collectively bargain, supporting things like the PRO Act, which is pending before Congress, which would you know, broaden the rights of um, workers to, to unionize and organize, is a way that you can sort of lift the boat for workers. And if you increase wages, uh, you give them more purchasing power, no matter what the private market does. Right, the domino effect, you know, trickles down. And hopefully, and even with the gas prices, I mean, it, it, it can't go any higher because people, I know, I know we're trying to shift to electric yeah. vehicles, but until it really fully takes place, the people are suffering with the gas, whether now with the summer coming to drive to their vacation spots or wherever. So hopefully that's topped off and it's not going to rise anymore. And that, another subject that comes up is marijuana, Yeah, you know, which is very controversial on a local level. Um, we have the, uh, the thing going on now between about police officers, should they be allowed to or not. Uh, but tell us about the federal level, what you think about the marijuana policy. Yeah, and before we do that, I just want to go back to the gas price thing, because, you know, in terms of the conversation we have about manufacturing in the United States, you know, we need to transition to a greener economy, right, a greener environment. And during that transition phase, we have to be mindful of the fact that people who are commuting to work, who are working families are still paying for gas, right? So we have to think about ways to, to drive the cost down. I think the, I think the federal government's been doing that. Um, but we also have to remember that when we rely on countries like Russia for our gas, that puts us in a weakened state from a national security perspective. So all these things are intertwined, where not only do we move towards a greener environment, a greener economy by transitioning to electric vehicles and make our, our climate cleaner and our environment cleaner, but we also make ourselves stronger from a national security perspective because we're not relying on third party um, international actors. I think that's important. Um, with respect to cannabis and legalization of cannabis, I think there's two important things at the federal level that we can do today. One is ensuring that, that anyone in the can cannabis industry where it's you know, legalized um, in various states has access to, to federal banks, right? Um, they have access to insurance. And currently those are two things that, that the cannabis industry, while legal in a variety of states and a growing number of states, they're currently continue to be detrimented because of federal policy. So I think those are two immediate things that wherever your views are on cannabis, right, they are gonna be actors in our economy. They should be able to have the access to those safeguards that will enable them to one worker safety. Because if you, don't, if you can't access a federally regulated bank, because of you know the current status of, of cannabis at the federal level, then you know people have to do things like keep cash on hand, and that makes some targets for crime. So um, I think those are two immediate things that you can do to sort of at the federal level to to make it a better playing field for folks that operate in the cannabis space. Well, for those out there, before we take the break, um, one cannot dispute the fact that uh, congressional candidate Menendez is definitely fluent in all the. Uh, most important issues that are facing this country and this district and that that's very impressive um one comment on the on the cannabis as far as with regard to law enforcement personnel i just see it as detrimental and not a good policy uh to allow police officers off duty to to uh, partake um and for very different obvious reasons but that's for a further discussion um when we come back from our commercial break Hudson County Commissioner Anthony Romano with congressional candidate Rob Menendez. And we'll continue on topics that are important to those in this area that we serve. And uh, Rob, be ready for some more. All right. Okay. Not everyone celebrates the birth of a baby. You have options. Don't panic. New Jersey has safe havens for unwanted infants. Leave the baby with staff at any hospital, ER, police or fire station or rescue squad. Call the number on your screen for Safe Haven locations or go to www.njsafehaven.org. No shame, no blame, no names. Safe Haven. For me, I just felt like it had to be done, you know, as an EMT. I saw things that, I, I saw how it affected the community and honestly, I just felt like I had to do it. My family was very against the, the vaccine at first but I kind of felt the need to do it so I can kind of just let them know it's gonna be okay. It's science, it's a pandemic, there's a virus going around and we need to stop it. And I feel like we live in an era where we have the technology to do that. It would just bring me peace as somebody in the front lines. 
just that's the only word I can say is just peace because you know I saw people that passed had passed away and I saw how it affected their families being in that moment when we had to tell them you know they're no longer here so living in a world with no pandemic honestly it just kind of makes me feel it would make me feel more peaceful when that peak happened of COVID let me tell you, it, I was working maybe like four days because they needed the extra manpower. We needed extra trucks on and we had help from FEMA. Not to mention our call volume is normally between five to eight jobs on a, on a 12 hour shift. When COVID hit, it was literally nonstop and they were all COVID related, every single one of them. Once this whole thing is over, I would love to see everybody to just be in a place where they don't have to be scared to give out hugs or handshakes or just, you know, just to say hi, you know? You don't have to hide in their own, you know, residence. Hudson TMA reminds you that a bicycle is considered a vehicle. When you ride a bike, you must obey the rules of the road. Ride single file in the same direction as traffic. Obey traffic signs and signals. Signal your turns and look behind you before you turn. And always stay alert. Well, welcome back to Stick at Night. Uh, with us is, uh, again, uh, Rob Menendez. Rob, years ago, um, and uh, it, it's kind of ironic, when I was going for my master's degree, a uh, assemblyman that represented Union City uh, helped me out. Uh, and his name was Bob Menendez. And he helped me with my thesis by getting me access to both um, Union City uh, statistics. And by, I got to study in uh, New York City from, to me, the finest police department in the world, New York City. And uh, your father was a big proponent even then in its embryonic stages of community policing. And as he rose up the ladder in government, along with uh, Congressman Ceres, they had grants, cops grants, um, to help, uh, you know, the policing of, of uh, the cities. And during this time right now, law enforcement is in a transition under attack for um, things that have happened that were wrong. And at the same time, this whole thing about the funding, which to me is ridiculous because the people that need the most are the ones that we have to serve. And at the same time, um, you're adjusting to body cameras, to the legalization of marijuana, to uh, different court cases that have come out, bail reform, which has turned things completely upside down. What do you think as a congressman, how you can help this situation alleviate it or how to make policing better? Or what suggestions would you have? What can the federal government do? Yeah, so listen, I think, I think the federal government can give um, various communities the resources that they need to grow their social services, right? From policing to, listen, one of the things that you failed to mention is how much we ask of cops, right? Cops have to respond to a multitude of situations. Some of them are violent, some of them are with people who um, are dealing with a variety of issues, you know, and we send them into a lot of different situations, right? And I think the last couple of years have shown us that if we, if we reduce the the, the, what we ask of our cops, we want better position them to focus on the things that, that they are the best trained to do. Uh, we move some of the social issues to people who are better trained for that. And you sort of alleviate the pressure that we put on cops in our communities. Um, I think that's an extremely important conversation that we should be having. And I think it's important to remember that whatever group you're talking about, right? If you're talking about uh, people on Wall Street, you're talking about cops, you're talking about teachers, union members, corporate owners, whoever, right? There's always going to be some bad actors, but that shouldn't color the entire group. And you know that, right? And I think when I look at situations in my life, right? So we mentioned that I went to high school in Hoboken, right? I stood on the Hudson River when on 9-11, right? And you know who ran into those buildings and tried to get people out. It wasn't me as a corporate attorney. It wasn't people, you know, who are, you know, working in different industries. It was first responders, it was cops who ran out there and risked their lives. Um, when we had this terrible incident in Jersey City where a kosher deli was attacked, they attacked with automatic rifles, pipe bombs. That's not stuff that I'm equipped or anyone else you know, who's a civilian is equipped to handle. We need our cops. We need to respect the work that they do. 
we can ask less of them. We can engage in honest dialogue with our community and seek feedback in terms of the ways that we can engage with our police. We can continue to um, recruit from the communities where we're asking our police officers to serve. We can always do a better job. We can, I believe we can always do a better job in our individual lives, right? We're always growing, we're always working to become better. Um, our communities are always striving to get better. Um, we, can, we can have more productive conversations. We can listen to the concerns of our community and get better outcomes. Um, that is what we should strive for. And we should be partners at the federal level to ensure that we're able to have those conversations and make those changes where everyone benefits. Well, I think one of the benefits of your candidacy is that the experience you have, the, uh, the relationship that you have created and nurtured over your time, uh, being in the community with the uh, local officials, um, whether it be municipal, county, uh, state, you have a very good reputation and you're respected uh, on your own. You stand on your own, which is, I think, important. Uh, you've never taken advantage of, uh, of who, you, who you are. And I think that's going to help you in, in many ways. So you've got that foundation. And you said a couple of things that I consider important. When you have a barrel of apples, and if it's a rotten apples in it, you take the rotten apples out, you don't destroy the barrel. And I think what you said is appropriate. Being over at 9-11 that same night when we were over there um, you know, with, uh, with our volunteers, uh, police and, and fire trying to, you know, the first recovery effort, you see the devastation. And it, it's important that elected officials understand the burden sometimes of now it's more social work that is expected of police officers. Because this idea that they're always in shootings is not, is not true. Most of the tasks you'll find are mundane if you look at the statistics. And it all, it all um, I think, spirals into the homeless situation. Everybody is, uh, you know, upset. Hoboken and Jersey City has a large homeless population. The shelters are doing what they can. But there's a disproportionate amount that are not, as we say, homeless. They're emotionally disturbed or that need further medical care. And how do we attack that problem, um, you know, which is, which is a problem in America, in, in the cities? Yeah, listen, I think we need to invest in our mental health, especially after the last two years. And listen, you know, it's impacted everybody from children, adolescents to adults to seniors who have been isolated. Um, and, you know, our failure to do so is leads to these bad outcomes for a lot of individuals, to a lot of families and to our communities. So I think the federal government has an obligation to continue to invest in mental health, create those resources in schools and public places um, and continue to give access to people to get the help that they need. Uh, because it is, we need to destigmatize it and make sure that people are engaging in a healthy way and have the resources that they need to live their best, most productive lives. Um, you know, that's that's something that we that we have to continue to fight for. How does one, Bob? We're, we're finished with the, with this. We see New York. We need to get New York going again, um, and encourage people to get back to work. As far as everybody wants to stay virtual. Do you, do you believe that it's time to go back? Yeah, listen, it's, or I think it's, it's tough to argue that our workforce is going to be different yes. moving forward. That's the reality. Uh, but, you know, when you, when you lose the sort of going to work and the, the, the sort of rhythm of a day, it impacts the entire economy, right? Folks who serve you your coffee and bagel in the yes. morning to the restaurants that serve you after you finish your shift or after you finish it, your, your job. And so we need to, we need to, Listen, if we want to encourage people to go back to work and get to a normal routine, we have to provide the safeguards for them to do so. That, in my opinion, is the government's responsibility to fix those issues so people feel comfortable, they feel safe. That's what we should always be doing, but especially in this moment after the last two years. Well, Rob, well said. It's been a pleasure having you on. I know we can go on and on. We wish you good luck in Thank your you. candidacy. Um, if you do attain the position, we know you're going to do a fine job representing all of us. And you're always welcome back here. We'll continue in another segment. I'm Hudson County Commissioner Anthony Romano representing District 5 with congressional candidate Rob Menendez. Thank you for listening.